Um, Megan Higgs is a statistician and owner of um, Critical Interference LLC. She has a PhD in statistics with over 20 years of experience working with researchers and practitioners across many different disciplines. She worked as a tenured associate professor of statistics at Montana U State University, where she taught mainly non-statistics um, graduate students, um, Bayesian inference and statistical consulting. In 2016, she took the plunge and moved outside of academia and worked for an environmental consulting company until returning to academia to be uh, an interim director of uh, statistical consulting for a center that she worked to start um, earlier in her career. In 2019, uh, she started her own statistical consulting company called Critical Inf Inter Inference LLC, where she mainly is involved in high level review, study design, um, leading different focus groups and providing individual professional development, as well as blogging when she, when she can find time. Her focus is no longer on doing statistical analysis, but instead reflecting on how and why we as a scientific community and culture tend to use statistical methods and results in science and decision making. Uh, the title of her presentation is Making Practical or Clinical Relevance a Key Part of Statistical Analysis. Um, and you should just be able to share your slides, Megan. Hopefully that works. And while Megan gets that set up, just a reminder to everyone that this is being recorded. Okay, how does that look? That looks great. And I'll also just remind people that um, they can ask questions in the chat and also the Q&A. Um, and if there's time at the end of uh, Megan's talk, we'll, we'll um, address some of those. And if not, then um, she can reply uh, in, in those venues as well. So over to you, Megan. Okay, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I really appreciate it and the invitation to speak today. So I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to, well, one, hear others speak, but also to have a chance to put this talk together. So this is one of those things that's been kind of swimming around in my head for years and um, now, and I just haven't taken the time or had the opportunity to put it into a little package, like a 15 minute presentation. So we'll see um, if I succeed in that. Um, as was said in the intro, like I am coming at this from a uh, formal, my formal, most of my formal training is as a statistician for an academic um, private industry and as an independent for uh, my company, Critical Inference, which is really just kind of me. Um, my motivation for this work really comes from my many years of work as a researcher and scientist and other disciplines, as well as working as a collaborative statistician. Um, and my just really love of thinking about how we should do research and could do research and just improvements that we could make. So I'm trying really hard at this point in my career to try to come up with some things that are not just um, pointing out what we're doing poorly or what we're doing wrong, but actually thinking about where we can insert things into the research process or the research workflow that maybe could have big implications for um, improving research, particularly relative to use of statistics in, um, in science. So that's my, uh, that's where I'm kind of coming from. Hold on, oops, sorry about that. There's my obligatory slide. Um, so maybe the, under, the theme that's underlying most of what I wanna say today is that context is incredibly important. And that coupled with my opinion that statistical norms often hinder incorporation of meaningful context into our research. So um, more specifically, like I see a lack of connection between clinical and practical relevance um, and statistical concepts and choices um, in design analysis and interpretation. I think statistical practice um, in most disciplines is too methods focused and methods driven rather than driven by the problem and the um, context, which it just leaves really a little room for context dependent decisions and really minimal, there's minimal expectations for justifying choices within a context, if we even realize that they're choices. I think this is a really important point that's just not really um, talked about enough is this like ec this minimal expectations um, piece. And I feel like we have to figure out how to kind of bump that up. So um, when I talk about statistical norms, I think, uh, you know, I could do a whole presentation on norms and like what we, what they are, what we think of, but I really want, I think a, a really thought provoking question that everyone can ask themselves is really kind of thinking about, well, what decisions do I make in my research process and particularly thinking about the statistical part of it that really are independent from context and don't really 
um, require of me much thought or justification just because of how we do things. And I think this question can uh, kind of raise awareness of things that we might not have realized were norms. We just take for granted as that we're supposed to do it that way, but uh, that's the tricky thing about norms, I guess. Um, so if, if I'm going to argue about uh, integrating context, I think kind of the first main question that comes up is like, well, when and how should we do this? Um, I think now the, the place that it's done is after the analysis. It's, so it's when you're writing the discussion, even after um, interpretation. Um, so it's when you're writing the discussion section, it's then you're supposed to kind of bring in, um, bring in a bigger context. I mean, hopefully it happens a little bit earlier, but I'm, I, I should say, like, I'm really talking about context relative to these, relative to quantitative measurements that we are, um, that we are taking. And so this is always like this post hoc explanation is always going to be subject to criticism um, of storytelling to match results and under current norms that I'm not saying I agree with, but it tends to be a defense of why we got statistical significance or reasons why we failed to obtain statistical significance. Um, I'm being very stereotypical here, but um, but that is a problem that I see. And when we do it post hoc, it's always going to be constrained by decisions that and choices that we made early on. So in the design and analysis um, analysis parts, and there's nothing we can do to fix that after the fact. So what I really want to argue today is that it would be much more effective to actually bring in the context around our quantitative research a priori and before starting. So what I hope that we can start to do is construct these context dependent backdrops is the term that I'm going to use actually during the study design process that will then serve as a reference throughout the research process. So something that's always there behind the scenes that we're con constantly um, referring back to when we're trying to um, interpret numbers, summaries, um, and results. So I'll give examples of this, don't worry. I know I'm being very vague so far. Um, and another key part of being having it a priori is it can help us encounter problems early in the research process. So at a time when we can actually fix them rather than just having to discuss them as limitations. Okay, so I have kind of borrowed this um, visual representation, and this is where the term backdrop came from, um, from like a stage or a theater production. So, um, oh, I just missed a slide, there we go. So currently I think, uh, or I see it as the statistical action is happening in front of the same curtain, the same kind of boring curtain over and over and over again, regardless of the setting. So, um, and this is kind of like back to the norm. So this might be um, choosing the same, same summary, choosing the same test, using the same criteria, using the same thresholds, um, making the same statements afterwards. Um, so really not context dependent, just methods focused. So what I think would be um, awesome is to encourage to take to create take the time to create context dependent backdrops and then open the curtain, right? So everything, all this statistical action that's happening is happening in front of a backdrop that actually has meaning and provides this reference and kind of reality check to things rather than leaving it um, to, to automatic things. Okay, so sorry, I keep uh, skipping ahead skipping ahead a slide for some reason. So um, what do we need to, to get here? Well, I think it should be a concrete step in the design phase. It's gotta be something concrete that people know, well, I'm sitting down right now to do this, this thing or this task that is part of my workflow. Um, and then I think the output needs to be something that's really simple and visual. So the important part is the whole process and not the output. But I think as part of that process, that output has to be like really accessible, shareable, and um, easy to have a conversation about. So in the, my current draft paper, the phrase that I'm currently going with, I'm not sure if I'll stick with it, is building a backdrop of meaning and magnitude or building a bomb. Um, I'm not really, I'm not uh, loving the kind of violent connotations of that, but it could be a bath bomb or something too, who knows. Um, so what do I, let, let me actually give you a very generic kind of simple version of, um, of what, I'm, what I'm thinking about. So, so here we have basically a number line. So that's as simple as it's going to get. It's this decorated, glorified number line. And this isn't something that's completely foreign to being part of, um, part of, 
statistical analysis at some point, but not necessarily done a priori like this. And then it's like the decorations are coming from the exercise of going through the process and identifying like what range of values would definitely be judged as practically meaningful or clinically relevant, or like a particular decision would be made based on them. Um, et cetera, versus those that would be judged to be not practically meaningful or clinically relevant, or however, like there's lots of ways we could phrase that. I'm going to go with those for now. And then also this gray area in between, which you don't see referenced very much, which is super important because there's no way we're going to get rid of that gray area. So we've got to start incorporating that into the process. And there's no real reason why we can't do that. Like we can navigate around that uh, gray area and have it influence our interpretations after the fact. Okay, so the basic ingredients of that very simple picture, um, well, they're basic, they're not simple ingredients. I mean, you have to confront measurement to figure out what scale to even put on that number line. What do those numbers represent? What are the units? Um, and what do those magnitudes mean? It also takes an understanding of how the results will be used. Like that's, you need that in order to really define the clinical and practical relevance piece. Um, you've got to have a connection to how parameters are going to be estimated. So maybe you have a great handle on measurement for an individual, but once you bump up to estimating, say, a difference in means or an effect, then you don't really know what, what should be considered practically meaningful or clinically relevant. So, you know, the biggest ingredient is there's a lot of thought and a lot of discussion that would go into this and the pictures that would come out of it um, would be of varying um, complexities, but that's kind of the simplest um, version. So, you know, we think about this, this pretty uh, colored number line um, and think, okay, well, eventually, like, we'll make it and then we'll compare our results at the end back to this, um, to this backdrop. And that is, in fact, something that I am suggesting. But I also think as part of the pro process, super important to look at and go through the process of thinking about hypothetical outcomes, a priori, before you have any results, just thinking about, okay, well, here are different ways that this can, that this can come out. So I'm going to display outcomes here as intervals. I don't care where you got your interval, how you got it. I mean, I do really, but, but uh, not for the sake of this. So it can be whatever your favorite uh, way of getting an interval is. Oops, I skipped ahead. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to go through four scenarios actually pretty quickly. There's a lot more I could say about them, but I just want to put the idea out there. So here's this scenario A where you have this really wide interval. It contains definitely the, lots of values that are definitely practically meaningful, also contains values that are not, and contains the whole gray area in between, obviously. Um, by current statistical norms, practice norms in many disciplines, this may this would be labeled as not significant. So studies of the results of this study not significant, and maybe the downstream story from that is that there's no effect, right? Whether that's like that, even with the problems of it, the reality is that's what um, that what that's what happens, which is not consistent, right, with the whole story of the interval. So here's a scenario B to um, to contrast that with. So here's one where um, as things currently go, it might be labeled as statistically significant um, because the interval doesn't include zero without looking at like the referent, like, without comparing it to some actually meaningful backdrop. And in this case, yeah, you've got a lot of precision. You've put a lot of information into that estimation and you've narrowed in that it only, that the only, um, values for that quantity that appear consistent with the knowledge you have are not considered practically meaningful or clinically relevant. So that's an incredibly important piece that would very much change your interpretation and decisions downstream. The next um, scenario, keeps doing it, C, um, is similar to B, although it also contains values in the gray area. So I'm not going to go into a huge difference, but even this, even the difference between these two should involve a little bit of a different discussion and, um, and different implications. And then we have the last one. Oh, I don't know why it's, why it's skipping on me. Sorry about that. Um, we have the last one, D, which, um, which contains more practically meaningful values plus the uh, gray area in between. So under current norms, B, C, and D are all deemed statistically significant. And the story that might go down the pipeline might be exactly the same for all of them or the downstream decisions that might be made. 
but they're very different and they, they deserve a very different story to go with them. And if people are forced to have that very simple number line at the beginning with these definitions, they're forced to actually think about these um, differences and add some con contextual um, information to it. Okay, so I just wanted to, um, speaking of context, I feel like I should at least try to bring in um, the context of MRI research. It's not something that I'm um, completely involved in right now. So I thought, oh, well, I'll just go search. I actually um, searched Francesca's website for some new um, publications and found this one from 2021. I actually have uh, members of my family who have had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So the context was relevant to me. Um, and I think it's super interesting that they are trying to use the MRI to track changes in um, ALS progression, disease progression, and also predict responses to therapy and clinical trials. So I'm not going to go into a big um, critique, but what I want to point out from this is just from reading a little bit of the paper and uh, kind of looking at some of the, the results and thinking about, okay, well, how, where would I start in terms of building this backdrop or like creating that kind of decorated um, number line or number lines. Uh, um, and so, and I want to highlight here the questions that it brings up, even just thinking about doing the exercise, even if you're not fully, go, fully going through the whole process as I'm not here. So in this case, like how is clinical relevance defined by those MRI measurements relative to, or relative to the quantitative measurements that are taken from the MRI? So where's that link between the quantitative scale and um, clinical relevance. Uh, how large does change have to be for an individual for it to be clinically noticeable, whether that's noticeable to the patient, whether that's noticeable to the clinician, um, according to other um, scores. Um, does it vary by individuals? This is a hugely important thing, like a chance to think about heterogeneity um, across individuals before just going forward and aggregating um, in um, default ways, which leads to the next one of like, okay, well, if you are going to aggregate and you are going to use averages, how do you interpret that back to the scale that you might have been able to think about for an individual, but might not be so clear once you've aggregated over individuals. So, um, and then, and then just like this really, like we want to think about how we can improve and add context beyond these kind of uh, common statements that like whatever the, whatever the quantitative measure was, was significantly increased in ALS subjects, right? Like that's, this is the type of statement that we hear um, a lot. And so the backdrop can help us get there and it can also help evade the trap of uh, significant or not as others have already um, talked about at this conference. And I think we'll probably hear more about that. So, um, so that was a short MRI context. Um, so I just want to end with some advantages. I probably went overboard on the advantages um, of this, but I also uh, think these are just important things in scientific practice, research practice in general, um, regardless of whether uh, you're talking about this backdrop approach. So first, it just encourages thinking really hard about measurement early on at that level of the individual and aggregated. Um, it encourages discussion and collaboration with other um, experts in the field and stakeholders um, before the research is done. So this isn't critiquing your research afterwards. This is actually coming together as a community and talking about what should that backdrop look like before we start going forward with research. Um, for, it forces facing problems and motivating changes in the design phase before it's too late to fix them. Um, it honors just the challenges in interpretation. I mean, challenges, it's, it's really hard to take these statistical results and interpret in a way that's, um, that's uh, meaningful. And this relates to one of my favorite new words, hermeneutics, which is the study of interpretation. It's kind of a meta-interpretation idea. Um, and it gives ownership back to the researcher that has been um, for a while in a lot of disciplines kind of handed over to rote use of statistical methods. So I think this really could be something that, um, yeah, that people can embrace. Um, I have a few more. Um, I think it does build expectations for researchers to justify um, and explain results relative to the backdrop. I just think that uh, building expectations for justification is super important. 
um, and shifts the focus away from relying on arbitrary criteria and default summaries, which then that's, um, that has downstream effects on a lot of the other problems that you hear about um, more often than you hear about a lack of context, which is like publication bias, lack of replicability, too much emphasis. So some of these actually maybe more even like symptoms down the, down the way. And it also promotes translation of research into practice. Um, I think um, more quickly, the papers should be more accessible and applicable. I think this applies to theory development as well. So, I mean, I really have to bring up disadvantages, right? Like I can't uh, give all these advantages without disadvantages. And I'm sure there are others, but really when it boils down to it, the main pushbacks that I have had in trying to get people to adopt this is that it takes time and effort for researchers. It's an extra step. It requires more justification. Um, writing can't be as formulaic and um, it requires more collaboration with others, which, which takes time. And so this is all reality though. Like this is a disadvantage that we really do need to face. And I don't know how to overcome th this disadvantage without kind of focusing more on the advantages. So that's all I have um, for um, today. Thanks so much for listening. I look forward to any questions. I did put some related references in here. They're not direct references. They're just things I thought you might think are interesting. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that that great presentation, uh, Megan. And and I do I do multiple sclerosis research, so uh, many of the things that you mentioned resonated with me. Um, you could just replace uh, ALS with MS and all the challenges that we face. You know, in individual variation and you know our cl clinical measures and trying to relate our MR measures to them. So um, so excellent excellent summary. Um, I'm just taking a look at the time, and I and I do see that our our, our third speaker did make it in here. So um, maybe if people have questions, they can just type them in the chat or the Q&A, um, and then you can keep your eye 